We saw last week the importance of wisdom as against mere knowledge. Now in the day in which we live, there is a great need for us to understand the difference between these two. Because very often what is exalted in the church, in what is called as the church of Jesus Christ today, is knowledge. What is manifested from the pulpits of many churches is knowledge, not wisdom. Many preachers of the Word of God, many pastors who preach regularly on Sundays, don't seem to find any contradiction between their proclaiming the gospel from the pulpit on Sundays and quarreling with their wives on Mondays, or losing their temper, or loving money, and other things like this. All this is the result of emphasizing knowledge. And the end result of this is Christian workers fighting with one another, churches full of strife, jealousy, and tension, and like the Corinthian Christians, babyhood is the condition of many Christians. The reason for all this is that wisdom has not sufficiently been emphasized in the Christian church. Wisdom is different from knowledge. A doctorate in theology proves that you have a good brain. But it doesn't say anything about your character or your spirituality. You may be thoroughly unconverted and on your way to eternal damnation. But wisdom is a characteristic of God. It is a knowledge of God himself. And a man may not have finished high school and yet have great wisdom, great knowledge of God and be truly spiritual. It's at the feet of such men that we should sit and learn. Not at the feet of those who have knowledge. For we become like those we learn from. If you are educated spiritually by another man who has knowledge, it fills your head. But if you sit at the feet of a wise man, you will be wise. Now here it, he speaks about that in verses 13 to 18 of James chapter 3. The difference between wisdom and knowledge. He says, if you have bitter jealousy, verse 14, and selfish ambition and strife, and you have arrogance, and you lie against the truth, this type of wisdom is earthly, it's merely knowledge. It's earthly, soulish, and demonic. This is the opposite of 1 Thessalonians 5.23. In 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, you read about man being a spirit, soul, and body. Notice the difference. Spirit, soul, and body. First, the spirit. This is the organ in man through which God seeks to communicate to man. And then, the soul and body subservient to the spirit under the rule of the Holy Spirit. Now, if you compare 1 Thessalonians 5.23, which God seeks to sanctify us entirely, beginning with the Spirit, with James chapter 3 and verse 15, you find the opposite. The wisdom that comes from beneath is, first of all, earthly. It deals with the body first. And then, it is soulish, or unspiritual and natural, as in some translations, the original word is soulish. And then, demonic. In other words, body, soul, and spirit. It's the opposite order. And when the devil seeks to bring a man into bondage, he begins with the body and then the soul and puts the spirit last. And if we yield to the lust in our body and begin to live in our souls, it's a short step from there to be controlled by demons. That which produces strife and jealousy, James says, leads on to that which is demonic. Very often we don't realize that. That it's demons who are behind this jealousy and strife. And therefore we have to be careful of a knowledge that does not transform our character. Charles Finney used to say that Bible knowledge without practical application is worse than no Bible knowledge at all. And that's what James is saying here essentially. If you increase in knowledge, it will bring you into demonic bondage if it doesn't change your character. So pursue after wisdom. In contrast, he says, if you have that real wisdom which comes down from above, it is first of all pure. Verse 17. And he goes on to say seven things in relation to this wisdom that comes down from above. First of all, it's pure. Second, peaceable. Third, gentle. Fourth, reasonable or willing to yield. And fifth, full of mercy and good fruits. Sixth, unwavering. That is, without any partiality. And seventh, without hypocrisy. Now, in the book of Proverbs, a lot is said about wisdom. And there is a book that we need to 
really study earnestly if we are to understand something of true wisdom. In Proverbs 3.13 it says, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom. Verse 14, Its profit is better than the profit of silver, and its gain than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand. In her left hand are riches and honor in all her parts of peace. Verse 18, She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And in chapter 9 of Proverbs, we are told that wisdom has built her house. Proverbs 9 verse 1, wisdom has built her house. The church is the house which wisdom builds. And she has hewn out her seven pillars. In Proverbs 24 verse 3 it says, by wisdom a house is built. The church can only be built with wisdom, not with knowledge alone. But knowledge which has become wisdom, which has changed character. And we are told in Proverbs 9, one of the seven pillars of wisdom. And it is these seven pillars that James tells us in James 3 verse 17. Here are the seven pillars of wisdom. First, purity. You see, the first characteristic or the first pillar on which wisdom builds the house called the Church of Jesus Christ is purity. If there's no purity, it's not the Church of Christ. Mere forgiveness of sins is not enough if it does not lead to purity. The first mark of divine wisdom is purity. The first mark of the true church of Jesus Christ is purity. Never forget that. And then the second pillar is peaceableness. James 3.17. The second pillar on which the church is built is peaceableness. Where a man has got wisdom, he does not strive with people. He avoids strife. You can never quarrel with a wise man. You can quarrel with a man who's got knowledge. He will argue with you. But you can't argue with a wise man, he will not get into strife with you. He'll avoid strife like he avoids hellfire. The second mark of wisdom is peaceableness. And thirdly, the third mark of wisdom, or the third pillar in the house which wisdom builds, is gentleness. There is no harshness in a man who is wise. A man who has knowledge may be harsh and hard. But a man who is wise is gentle. That doesn't mean he compromises. He doesn't compromise at all. He stands for all the truth, but like Jesus, he's full of grace and truth. There's a balance in his life, and so he's gentle. He's gentle even in his rebukes. And he's gentle in presenting the truth to those who disagree. Fourthly, a fourth pillar is reasonableness. He's willing to yield. He doesn't stand on his own rights. He's willing to yield and give up. He's willing to deny himself and give up his rights. He takes up his cross, dies to himself. This is a fourth pillar that must be found in the church. Fifth, full of mercy and good fruits. The good fruits of mercy, that is, forgiving other people, no matter what wrong they do to you. This is a mark of wisdom. This is a pillar on which on the church is built. Full of mercy. Readiness to show abundant mercy to others. This is God's characteristic. He is rich in mercy. Sixthly, unwavering, unshakable. He doesn't show any partiality to anyone. The rich and the poor are all the same to him. Like God, he's impartial. He doesn't shake about like a, a plant tossed in the wind. He's unwavering. And he's genuine, without hypocrisy. He's sincere, without any hypocrisy in his life. These are the seven pillars of wisdom. And there you see how many churches are being built on these pillars. No wonder many churches are shaking because they are not built on these pillars. Here is something which we can examine ourselves profitably in. The work which I am doing, is it being built on these pillars? Or is it being merely built on knowledge? If so, I should produce others who are full of arrogance and strife and jealousy. But if I am building in a divine way, this will be the characteristics of the lives to whom I minister and of my own life, characterized by divine wisdom.